Well, ladies, if you've got the guy, the dress, and you've sent out the save the date cards, but are you really ready to get married? Well, there are a few things that every couple should know about each other. Relationship therapist Keith Miller is here now with some simple talks, some simple, simple tips that will help your relationship last. Keith, thank you very much for coming in. Good thanks. to see you. Thanks for having me. Uh, first thing off, I, I suppose, is <laughs> the simple fact of communication. He supposes. If you're, if you're not... <laughs> If you're not you don't communicating, know about this, so. <laughs> I know when I'm not communicating that uh, there's trouble down the road. Sure, sure, that's a good sign. Yeah, this is such an important topic because you know you, you're you're about to get married. You're spending a lot of money. By on average estimates, people spend thirty thousand dollars just on yes. each wedding. That's a, that's kind of a low number for some yeah, people. Yeah, it is. So you want to be there. And what would you give if you could have 100 percent confidence about that? Uh -huh. So communication, yes, is, is one thing that comes up. It's one thing I talk to people about all the time. It's it's overlooked. People assume that they're good communicators. Right. And, um, you know, really when you look at it and when you get down into it, it's hard to be a good listener. Mm -hmm. You know, because most of us do what I call this broadcasting style of a communication, which is you just send the message out there and hope that somebody gets it. <laughs> and most of the time that works good enough. Or maybe we like to be heard, but we're not listening to the other person. Exactly. It, it's, yeah. you know, we might not want to spend the time to invest to listen. But uh, a different kyle, uh, ki style of communication would be what I call dialogue, where you're actually intentional about whether that person can receive the message. Yeah. So, for example, if I'm, to use an analogy, uh, playing catch, if I'm throwing a 90-mile-an-hour fastball at your head, you probably can't catch that unless you're really ready, unless you've had some good practice with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So I need to be cognizant and aware of my receiver, of who my partner is, and what it's like in their world to receive my message. That's makes, it makes sense. That that's, uh, makes great sense. Let that, me ask you this, Keith. What do you think people fail to talk about before they go down the aisle? Oh, number one thing. Uh, number one thing I would say probably uh, would be about just what they're going to do after you know, the meaning of, of their, their marriage, the meaning of commitment. You know, that's something that you, people are resistant or, or maybe not even thinking about, wanting to rock the boat, talk about, well, what does this mean, uh, are, are getting married? What's your history with commitment? Mm -hmm. um, what are the areas that you might be concerned about? Mm -hmm. And could we share those things together? So people don't, uh, you know, they want to talk about, of course, where they're going to live. Those are all important things. You, they're practical things. Do we want to have kids? Those are things that a lot of couples therapy focuses on. But um, the kind of lifting up the hood, looking under the hood, Looking at the questions. rough spots. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable you don't want to rock the boat, but it can be done in such a way that you learn some, sil some skills, simple skills, mm -hmm. about how to just talk about some of those important things. What does commitment mean to you? What does commitment mean? How do I respond to anxiety? How, how do you respond to stress? Yeah, what that's a good one. Like? That's a good Next mm -hmm. one on the list is do you know if you're really compatible? And, you know, I've had friends that, you know, either get married in the Catholic Church or whatever religion they have, and they go through that, that pre-counseling that I think a sure. lot of people don't. I mean, it works. It may not work to each his own. But I don't think people really sit down and, and, and talk about it. They know that they're in love and you're so dreamy, <laughs> you know. But That wears off eventually, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. It of does. Of course it does. And you know, the fact of the matter is, I think compatibility is somewhat of a myth. There's a misnomer about compatibility. Of course, you have to have some things in common, shared values. All the research indicates that you, having some overlap is important, so you're not on two separate planets starting off. Mm -hmm. But compatibility is not the only thing that you should be looking at. In fact, um, two people have said, you know, actually two very different people, Leo Tolstoy, the author, the writer, and Billy Graham said, both very different people said the same thing, that it's not compatibility at all that really matters. At the end of the day, it's how you deal with incompatibility. Mm. How you make it work. How, how you, you make, make it, it compatible. Because people Absolutely. do change. People Everybody, do change. even after you get married, you know, Absolutely. change in ways that your partner may not have expected. Absolutely. And we should expect that that's the norm, that's the way it's supposed to happen. Not only in your relationship do you evolve together as a couple, moving from that romantic sort of honeymoon stage where things kind of go on autopilot. You don't really have to ask for too much. It just happens. That's, that's kind of nice. But moving into that phase where you have to ask for things, that's where most couples go off the road unexpectedly. Um, so it is important to, to know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And this kind of segues well into frustrations and criticism and, and how to deal with that after the honeymoon's done. Absolutely. That's when it's going to come up. You'll know the, the honeymoon is over when, the, when you get the list of frustrations or the things that, that are wrong. Why do you always do this? Of course. Yeah, when that starts coming up. Of course. And both, both males and females are guilty of this. You know, this tends to be one, I have to say that along the genders it, it separates a little bit, that females sometimes aren't aware of how powerful their words are and how much they mean to men. And, of course, men are somewhat guilty for for creating that mm -hmm. misnomer because we might pull away and pull back to avoid being criticized. Uh, but what that does is that creates more criticism. Mm -hmm. So it's important to realize how um, shaming words can be. 
to a man uh, for the female in the relationship to realize that. You know, uh, you, you, that goes uh, segues into the first point you made, uh, the analogy about the, the 100 mile an hour fastball coming yeah. at your head. <laughs> and you have to be aware of how prepared that person is to receive that. Yes. I find that, that in, in my marriage, uh, I can, I'm a better listener mm -hmm. if I'm not facing you. For instance, if you oh, were sure. my wife sure. and, and she has something very important to tell me, I find that so I listen to her. <laughs> she interprets it often as I'm turning right. my back on her and right. I'm not listening. I find yeah. that I listen better. That's an excellent point, Doug. Actually, some of the research has shown, and, and just practical evidence, shows that if the female can understand that, that, that he's not turning you off, that's actually his way to stay connected to you. Is and to, to take it in. Okay, to, Natasha? Yeah, right. Okay, it. dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Activities for men. Are re is really their way of staying grounded and staying connected to themselves. I think it's a good point because women are so emotionally driven and if something really means something to me, I don't think we notice sometimes if we're so high strung on the issue, we're, how I'm coming off exactly. to you. You exactly. know, it's just like, this is bothering me and rah, rah, rah. Exactly. Now, now think about this for a second, Natasha. Now, yeah, watch out. Yeah, now see what happens. <laughs> is, you know, guys are, are think of themselves as the protector in the relationship. And this is true of all social mammals even. You look at other species. Mm -hmm. that the, the males in the species are the protectors. And they're looking at the females to watch their anxiety. And the females, of course, are looking at all the relationships to see what's going on. It's the tend and befriend type of right. uh, mentality in females and how they're socialized. And so guys, you know, they really, our, our goal is to protect. And so when we're pulling back, now we have to communicate to women, to the, the, the women in our life, that we're not abandoning them that they're not alone. So that's what guys need to learn. It's really simple. It's not as involved. It's not de deconstructing your relationship. It's pretty basic. If pretty you get basic. down to it, we just don't pay attention to it, I guess. It's saying, you know, I, I enjoy being with you, but I, I do need to also play golf sometimes. <laughs> hey, hey, that's a key in a relationship. Let him have his time. I, I need my time, too. Okay, let, I'm going to skip ahead because you don't have much time left. Let's talk about sex, gentlemen. Yeah, uh, boy, that's a, that's a oh. red-hot issue. <laughs> well, you know, it's an important topic. It's, it's, I think it's sort of like the canary in the mine. Because it requires, when, when things are going right, sex is usually what going right also. But when right. anything starts to go off, sex is the thing that starts to misfire as well. And, and people are scared to talk about it. People are scared to talk about it. You know, and it's one of those things that it, it, sex can be derailed by talking too much about it, obviously. So that's right. part of the reason why people don't want to talk about it. It's something, it's an activity, frankly. So, um, but if you don't talk about it, that's going to kill it as well. Because there are things mm -hmm. you have to get conscious about, and it can't be on autopilot. Um, for too long. You know, there's that great, great line in an old Woody Allen movie, and I can't remember which movie it was, Annie Hall maybe, uh, where there's a scene of, of each of the uh, uh, spouses visiting their respective psychiatrists, and, <laughs> and the psychiatrist says, how often do you have sex? And she says, oh, way too often, three times a week. Cuts to him talking to his therapist. He says, "How often do you have sex?" He says, "Never, three times a week." <laughs> so, you know, it's all in how you look at it, right? And it's all in how relative. you talk about it. I'm sure. Absolutely. There's a way to talk about difficult subjects and still stay connected to each other. Those are skills that that we're not taught. We're not taught in in school, most schools, um, how to be relational in our communication. We normally just learn how to debate and do point counterpoint types of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to stay We're connected fighters, with somebody. Talkers, We're fighters, not talkers, right, Keith? <laughs> hey, you know, th there's nothing wrong with that except when there's something wrong with that, yeah. I guess. I got you. Keith Miller, thanks for coming in. Thank you. We appreciate Great it. Great advice. Thanks.